As requested by Gabe, the scripture today will be Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Preach the word, Gabe. Preach the word. All right. Good morning. Can y'all hear me pretty well? All right, perfect. Have you guys ever wanted something so badly that you'd be willing to do anything to get that? Maybe it was a prize of some sort. Maybe it was a medal for some competition. <clears throat> maybe it was a new job promotion. Or maybe it was the attention of someone. Someone maybe you liked, like a boy or a girl. I know, I've definitely done some crazy things just to get the attention of someone I liked, to get the attention of some girl. Because my goal and my whole attitude when I was at those points in my life were, I just want her to like me. So I was going to do anything I could to do that, whether it was pretending to be interested in the things she liked or acting like, kind of like a bully, teasing her all the time, when in reality, I just liked her. I don't know, maybe some of y'all can relate to that. But one of my favorite examples of this kind of idea is in the movie Tarzan. Now, if you haven't seen Tarzan, I highly recommend. Please go watch it. It's such a fun watch. And in this movie, we meet Tarzan, who is a human just like you and me. But due to, due to some unfortunate circumstances, he's left stranded in the jungle to fend for himself. But he's lucky enough to be found by a mother gorilla, and she takes care of him for the rest of his life. So even though he looks just like you and me, he acts completely different. He acts like a gorilla. He walks like a gorilla. He speaks like a gorilla. All of his mannerisms are a gorilla. And that was his life for a very, very long time. Until one day, his whole world changed. He met Jane. I don't know if any of y'all can relate to seeing that, that girl or boy and your whole world just changes. It, all, it becomes all about them. And that's what happened to Tarzan. From then on out, throughout the whole movie, he tries to learn what it means to be a human. There's even a whole musical montage in explaining what his goal is. And so he tries to speak English. He tries to walk like us. He tries to learn how to use everyday objects just to get Jane to like him because that was his goal. And, of course, at the very end of the movie, that's what happens. He gets, he gets the girl. He gets Jane. And that might seem like a very silly example, but I think it pretty, pretty well expresses this idea of we are willing to do whatever we can to get what we want, especially if it's what we feel is best for us. Now, I want to take that idea, and let's take it one step further. What about the people we care about, the people we know, like our friends, our family? We clearly care about them, right? For those of you who have children, you want what's best for them. So you're, you were willing to do whatever it took to get them to have that goal, whether it's putting them in the right school, disciplining them, giving them the presents they want for Christmas, you want to show them that you love and care for them, right? Well, and that makes sense. Now, let's take this idea one step further. We can do that, do that for ourselves, and we can do it for those we care about. But do we have the same mentality when it comes to the people we don't know, to the people groups we know nothing about that we would rather stay away from, or the cultures of the world that kind of scare us or seem strange, to the strangers we see every day, do we want what's best for them? If so, if you, if you have that mentality and you have that idea and you have that want, well, what do we do about that? How do we correctly express to these people that we don't know that we love them and we want what's best for them? That there's something out there that will give them purpose in life, give them hope. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. And in this passage, we're going to see Paul, who is kind of put in the same situation we've been talking about. He wants to express the gospel to all kinds of people, and he has that desire. In this passage, we're not only going to see what motivates Paul to speak to these different kinds of people and these different people group, but what his desires and why he goes about it the way he does. And ask ourselves the question, 
do we have that same motivation, the same mentality, and the same desire to spread the gospel to all people? And if that can be implemented in our lives today as a church in 2024. So, if you have your Bibles, we'll start reading in verse 19. It says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, <clears throat> in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And to those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. <clears throat> I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it, for every athlete exercises self-control in all things. <clears throat> they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So looking at this passage, looking at the first couple verses, in verses 19 through 23, we see what I like to call Paul's strategy or, or Paul's plan of action, his game plan in approaching these different groups of people. We see in the very beginning, in the first verse, in verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself, what? A servant to all. For some context as, as to why he's saying this, in the verse for first few verses, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 9, Paul is essentially writing to the Corinthians saying, I have all of these rights. I have all of these things I deserve. But instead of boasting about that and implementing those rights, there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger gospel and a bigger world and a bigger goal that we need to focus on, that I, as Paul, need to focus on. And so he tosses aside those things and he humbles himself. He understands that he has no bondage to anyone, yet he still denies himself of this right. And he becomes a servant to what? To gain more and to help others. And we see those groups of people he's helping in this passage. We see four specifically, the Jews, those under the law, those not under the law, and the weak. Now, when it comes to those first two people group, the Jews and those under the law, it's very easy for Paul to relate to them. I mean, Paul himself was a Jew. We see in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Paul lists his credentials into being a Jew. He's saying, he's like, I understand it. And we don't have time to go into that, but go look at that at your own free time. So he understood how it, what it meant to connect with a Jew. And the same thing with those under the law. As a Jew, he was very knowledgeable in what the law had to say. And so he could connect with those people. So pretty easy. And the same thing with those who are outside of the law. Even though Paul was a Jew, he also was a Roman citizen. He was a Gentile. And so he could relate to that, that kind of cultural difference and not being, out, being outside of the law and could connect with them. But then there's the last group, the, the group he, he refers to as, as weak. Now, there's a couple different re things we could, uh, we could think about when referring to the weak. When I was studying this, there, I, I really didn't understand when he called someone weak, was he referring to someone who was physically weak? I was very confused. But if you, one of the things Paul might be referring to here is in chapter 8, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about idol worship, specifically eating food purposely designed in idol worship. And we don't have time to go over that. But in that chapter, he refers to those who are doing that as weak of conscience or weak of mind. So he could very well be referring to the weak, referring to those people in this passage, but I think, and I think what could also be a, a more valuable answer is that he's referring to those Christians who aren't where they're at spiritually. In their relationship with God, in their spiritual, spiritual journey, they're not where they should be. They're still drinking spiritual milk. They're not moving on to bigger food that will, that will feed them and nourish them better. But even with those groups of people, those he's referring to as weak, He's still not shaming them for that. 
He's approaching them with love and kindness so he can connect with them. And he's doing that with all of these groups of people to do what? So that he might, he might save some of them. But it's important for us to understand when looking at these different groups of people and implementing the same idea today to kind of understand what he means to become when he says, I became like these groups of people. Now, is he saying for us today in order for us to connect with, say, the LGBTQ community, that we need to become like someone part of that community, that we need to be, apply that lifestyle to our lives. No, he is not saying that at all. He's simply saying he is meeting these people where they're at. So an example that was given to me when explaining this idea is, say, Paul is meeting with a Jew. Now, as a Jew, uh, uh, that Jew has certain rules and laws he has to follow because he's under the law. And one of those rules being he can't have meat, or he can't have certain types of meat, such as pig. Now Paul, understanding this, but being a Christian, is no longer under that law. He could have bacon as much as he wanted to. And so even though he has every right to do that, if Paul was going to meet with this Jew, do you think Paul's going to eat a BLT in front of this Jew? No. I know that seems silly, but it's that same idea. It'll be disres- it would be disrespectful to that Jew. Even though Paul had every right, has every right to do that, he wants to meet them where they're at. He understands the cultural differences, the, their way of life with all of these p- groups of people. That is his game plan. That's his strategy. He approaches them where they're at. But it's also important for us to understand that he's not compromising the gospel either when doing this. He is merely finding a way to present the whole gospel in a way that is effectively communicated to that group of people or that person. So it's important for us today when approaching these different groups of people or these cultures that we understand where they're coming from. How did they grow up? What, what is their culture like? And once we understand that, then let's approach, it, approach them with the gospel in a mo- more effective way. Now, that's his game plan. We see that with all of these groups of people. But the next question I ask, and maybe you're asking, is why? Why is Paul doing this? Well, we see that in verse 23. It says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share share with them in its blessing. He's doing it for the gospel. But more than that, he's doing it so that he can partake in the blessings that that he receives when sharing the gospel. Now, again, I can't speak for you guys, but that's kind of an interesting thing for me, when thinking about the blessings I receive when sharing the gospel, I don't usually think about that. But when I've looked back, when I've had the opportunity to present the gospel, whether to a family member, or to a friend, or to a stranger, there are plenty of blessings I receive. One of them, for me, is that it serves as a reminder to me as who I, sh- who I should be thanking for my salvation. It's a great reminder as to where, where I'm at in my life, and it wouldn't be that way if it wasn't for Jesus, if, if it wasn't for someone sharing the gospel with me. But I feel like I I I didn't feel satisfied with that. So I asked David Henniger, I asked him, I was like, when you've gotten the chance to share the gospel with someone, what blessings do you feel like you receive when doing that? And he sat there for a while, and then he finally answered me um, saying this, that when he's gotten the chance to share the gospel with someone and they obey, it's like he gets a new brother and sister in Christ. He gets the chance to to be blessed in a new relationship. And when he said that, I couldn't help but think of those of us who have younger siblings and remember the day those younger siblings were born. What a blessing it is to have a new family member in our lives. Now, I was a bit too young to kind of remember when my sisters were born. I was around two years old. But my mom says that even at that age, even if I wasn't aware of it, when they brought my sisters home, I couldn't stay away from them. We were inseparable. And even at that age, I understood what a blessing it was to have two sisters, two brand new sisters in my life. It's the same thing when we get the chance to share the gospel. What a blessing it is. And so Paul wants to partake in that. And so we see his game plan. We see his why. But what's his motivation? Let's let's dig deeper into this why. What's motivating him? Well, we see that In verses 24 and on, he uses this analogy of running a race. He says in the very beginning, 
At verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. For any of us who participated in sports or some sort of activity that required a competition, why is it that why did you put yourself in that competition? To win. You want the gold. You want to win the competition. That's why you enter into it. And Paul is saying it's the same thing in the Christian race. When we become Christians, we're put into this race. It's going to take a whole lifetime to run. And we want to win it right. But something that's beautiful, and Paul doesn't mention here, but we know, is that what's beautiful about this race is that we all participate in it. And we're all going to receive that prize. But it's important for us to understand that we need to have a mentality as if there was only going to be one win, one winner. Because I can't speak for you guys, but I know in my life, when I've become lax as a Christian, when I've looked at this race and said, well, all of us are going to get it. Why try so hard? Those have been the times in my life where I've struggled the most, where I've fallen short. So let's keep a mentality that we're going to be the only ones winning that prize. So we run our hardest We give it our all so that we shoot for the gold. And then Paul moves moves on and kind of explains how we run this race. Specifically in verse 25, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in what? In all things. Again, for those of us who played sports, what did you need to do to improve playing that sport? You needed to show up to practice. You needed to practice discipline, whether that meant, like I said, going to practice Or maybe staying away from certain foods and eating this, eating better. It requires discipline, practice, habit. And he moves on saying that athletes practice self-control to gain a perishable prize or a perishable wreath. And the context of of this passage, and this one specifically, back then when there was a sports competition or event, there was a wreath that was made for the winner. It was made from branches and leaves and the, the competitors would do everything they could to win this wreath. It was seen as such a high honor. But what was super interesting about this wreath is that within a day or two, just go away. It would wither away. It would be destroyed. So all of that hard work for something that would just perish. But us, as Christian athletes in this race, we have a wreath waiting, wreath waiting for us at the very end. But this wreath, it's not going to go away. It's going to last forever. It's an imperishable wreath. And we know that wreath to be, or that gold, or that that crown, to be life with God for all eternity. So practice. Practice self-discipline, self-control. Run as hard as you can so we can obtain this wreath. Now moving forward, we see Paul's motivation. He uses it as an analogy of running the race. We also need to understand that, yes, he's doing that for himself, but he doesn't want to hide that prize and that opportunity away from the people that don't have Christ. We need to understand that we need to share this wreath with all people so that they may run the race as well. We can't can't keep it to ourselves. And finally, in verses 26 through 27, Paul talks more about discipline. He says, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. In verse 26, we see that Paul understood that there was a goal to reach. There was no time to be wasted, whether for himself or for the people he needed to share it with. There was no time to be wasted. We, we can't run aimlessly in this race. We can't beat at nothing, guys. We have a goal, and Jesus wants us to reach that goal. Secondly, we see Paul humbles himself through self-control and discipline. He understands that he needs growth. He needs constant growth. And Paul also understood that he held a position of influence and power over many Christians in that area. And so he needed to set the best example he could so that they could see that example and follow suit. I know for a lot of you who were missionaries or ministers or teachers and preachers for a long time, it was important for you guys to have the best example, right? So that the church you were working with or the people you were studying with could see your example and follow suit. He understood that. 
And of course, finally in verse 27, Paul himself sees this opportunity as a blessing to share the gospel. And he doesn't want to be disqualified of that. So he, self, he practices self-control and discipline for all of these different reasons. As we begin to conclude, I can't help but ask the question, how does this apply to us today in 2024? What, what does this race analogy have to do with us? What does this p- game plan Paul has have to do with us today? Well, when studying this and preparing this lesson, these are questions I ask myself and I want to ask you guys as well. Do we have a game plan ready to reach people? Are we prepared to reach and connect to every kind of person, to every kind of culture, to every kind of people group? Are we motivated to run the race with all that we've got and to encourage others, whether they're in Christ or not, to do the exact same? And are we practicing self-control? Are we constantly humbling ourselves to allow spiritual growth to happen? For any of these questions, if some of your answers were, yes, I'm ready to do that, or I want to do that, then the next step is like, well, so what do we do about that? What can we do today? Well, the first thing we can always do is draw near to God. In whatever way that suits or fits best for you, do that. Whether it's through prayer or study or silence and solitude, any discipline that you just yearn for or you feel, ad- uh, feel well towards, do that. Draw near to him. Secondly, humble yourself. Tell yourself that it's okay to grow, that where you're at isn't your peak, that there's always more to improve upon. And approach that with humility so God can grow you. Thirdly, learn to love people the way God did, the way Paul does. Realize that everyone in this world is a child of God and that God created them special and that God doesn't want any of his children to perish. Let that motivate you. Let that teach you to love these people, even if you don't know their names. So study his word and let it be put on your heart so that it doesn't just stay up here, but it's lived out here. It becomes your way of life. So let the gospel motivate you with all love and compassion. So train hard, discipline yourself, and encourage one another to do the same. Like I said earlier, it's beautiful that we all get to run this race together. And we're all at different parts of the race. So help each other. Bear one, bear one another in their burdens. Again, as I close, I want to ask us all, are we willing to do whatever it takes to give what's best to the people that we don't know, to all people? If not, if you feel like you're not there, then I want to encourage you to reach out to us. We're a family here. And we want to do whatever it takes and provide you with whatever need that you need to become a better servant of God, to be a more effective Christian. But if you are willing and you want to do this, then I challenge you and I challenge myself to go preach the gospel to all people, to every kind of person. Meet them where they're at. Learn their culture. Learn where they came from. Save them, not only for the sake of, sake of their benefit, but save them for the sake of the gospel.